G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. In this second part of our no sculpt poly modeling series, we are going to create the body of this character here. So um, as you can see, this is the final result. And uh, my big emphasis on this next hour is all about those loops. So we're gonna talk a lot about those and approach it with that in mind. And of course, don't be afraid to sign up for my Patreon if you feel like downloading the source files for this video, along with ad-free content and other bonus goodies. And of course, if you just enjoy the content as you're watching it right here and want to support the channel, feel free to give a like, subscribe and all that other crap. So I just thought I'd give you a quick little time lapse of how I designed the body for this character. And it's a little bit different from the previous video where I used like Photoshop or something like that. And the real honest to God um, reality is that you don't even need Photoshop to do this anymore, at least in Blender. You can just use the grease pencil to design out or at least sketch out a general shape of the body that you want to create, which is super fucking cool. Um, in this case, I'm just making a very basic um, sketch of the proportions that I want for this character. So I thought that'd be fun to show you. And uh, I just do the front and the side. And the great thing about the way that grease pencil work is that you can treat it almost like a mesh in of itself. So if you want to change proportions or anything like that, you have the power of both um, edit mode as you see here, but also being able to change the pivots of things um, just like you would like any other mesh inside of Blender. So that 3D cursor becomes really, really useful when you're just trying to work out arm lengths and leg lengths and rotations and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of incredible how useful that damn 3D cursor is and it's really strange to me how not many other apps or any app at all really doesn't have this thing it is so freaking useful it's ridiculous the great thing about um, using grease pencil at least is that uh, unlike other software you can treat them like different objects and um, they're not going to get in the way of one another and even better is that because you're working in 3D space, it's very easy to line up your um, model sheets, just overlap them. And then once you're ready, just rotate them in 3D space. It's uh, a really quick and efficient way to block out proportion. Um, of course, if you want to go even more refined and have a fully finished turnaround or fully finished model sheet, you can do that in Blender technically. Um, but for these purposes, I just don't give a shit. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously if you're working to a very specific, um, set of parameters for character design, then yeah, of course you'd go ahead and make a more refined version. But if you're just doing this for fun or just practicing, then this is plenty of detail for, um, getting the right kind of, um, I guess reference ready for the modeling process. So my recommendation for this video is for you to check out the chapters first, watch through them and then follow the video. The reason is, is because I take a more naturalistic approach to the modeling of this character, i.e. I model the way that I do when I am off camera, off recording, not doing my thing. So that means I make corrections, I make mistakes, I make changes along the way. I am going to show you my thought processes rather than showing you a blow by blow breakdown. So just like the previous video, I want to talk a little bit about the, the key loops that I would recommend you try and implement into your models. And the ones I've highlighted are basically the ones that, um, in my opinion, help to aid in the deformation of your mesh in really uh, clear ways. So if you're going to rig something, you want to be able to get reliable results as quickly as possible from that mesh. So the key points that I always consider to be really important are namely the hips, uh, the interface between the legs and the hips specifically, um, the shoulders, elbows and knees, of course, and finally the digits of the hands and thumb. And just like the face muscles and the way that the loops are shaped around those in the previous video, very similarly, the uh, loops that we have here conform to the musculature or the anatomy of the human body as well. So keep that in mind. So I want you to pay close attention to specifically the chest muscles, the bikini line or, or where the hips sit between the legs and the abdomen and the shoulders. All right, so let's get started. Quickly, I wanna preface this that certain areas are optional depending on your model. 
So keep that in mind. And that uh, depending on what you need from that model, you can either ignore or uh, accentuate certain parts of this uh, method um, for your needs. It's completely up to you. So what I'm gonna do is start off with a simple plane, mirror that with a mirror modifier, and we're going to establish our very first loop, which is our center line. And that's very similar to the previous video where we are going to trace out our key loops. So I'm gonna start off with the very simplest loop, which is basically around the abdomen. So um, the upper abdomen, just beneath the breasts, it's gonna work out our very first loop that sort of sits at uh, the interface between the chest and the abdomen. And just a reminder, um, if you're using the mirror modifier to make sure that you have clipping turned on, that way you won't have the edges overlap along the center line. Secondly, make sure that your uh, key object is also um, applied with its translation. So what we're doing here is essentially just working out that very first ring of geometry. Now I'm operating at a faster speed in this video because at this point I'm only using like three tools, extrude, move, fill, that's basically it. So um, for me to go through every little tiny bit, it's kind of silly. So um, take that for what you will, but ultimately it's more important that you understand the loops over the actual tools that I'm using because you can use any tool you want. Um, so as you can see here, just like in the previous video, I'm sort of working out my profile. So just like in um, the face tutorial, I'm working out that sort of center line loop. And I've talked about this before in my previous videos, but basically I always prefer to make sure that I have a center line loop that is uninterfered. So basically there's no merging of vertices along that center line that if you need to separate the sides, so from left and right, you can always do so without anything going wrong. Um, and as you can see here, I'm basically working out that abdomen shape, that, 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 that torso shape with that center line there. And this will help me establish volume very quickly, but also um, give me a point of reference to start my other loops. So I'll know when to, where to start my chest loops, where to start my um, hip loops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it already, you can already start to see that volume take shape, which is really cool because it's very quick and efficient. So going into the shoulder now, I'm working out my first loop that sort of circulates around the upper section of the shoulder. And that's a continuous loop. So there's no interference there. The other key loop will be a continuous loop around the inner track of the shoulder. So I always like to have at least a little bit of a gap between the interface between the shoulder and the bicep. So a nice loop that separates it, gives it a little bit of volume and a little bit of separation, makes it a lot easier to rig. So I like to make two loops and we'll join those in later on, but you'll see what the reason is for that in a moment. Do the same thing for the thighs. So duplicating that loop down to the thighs and because we have the mirror modifier the other side's getting done basically at the same time which, which is great and don't have to worry about performance don't worry about turning on any subdivision modifiers at the moment uh, work with the low poly i'm also adding a second loop in that center line now because it's continuous there shouldn't be any interference between those loops and the reason i'm splitting that in half is basically to uh, allow myself to give myself the geometry i need to build out the torso and the hips so another continuous loop that goes around the hips, fill it in, and that will be the interface between the uh, abdomen area and the bikini line. So again, it's a continuous loop that goes around the center of the body. And just like in the previous video, I'm always taking the time to tweak what I can, even at the lowest stage. So the lowest amount of detail, it will help you maintain volume or establish volume as quickly as possible. Pause, take stock, and then polish up a little bit here and there. Now for our first, I guess you can call it complicated loop. It's a extrusion of that bikini line. So basically just select the loop, extrude out, and you'll get this nice continuous loop that automatically gives you the volume you need to get that bikini line working. Then it's a matter of joining up a loop that, again, is sort of like the shoulder where it almost loops around underneath it. So again, reference back to that video at the start and you will see what I mean. And the importance of this loop that goes underneath the bikini line is that it will provide the volume you need to get the hip bone in there. So it's really, really useful to have. So you'll see just by shaping it out now, we're already getting the right volume we need to basically establish the hips, um, the lower abdomen, um, the interface between the butt and the thigh. And um, yeah, it starts to naturally form out 
fairly quickly. So just a few more fills, you're basically creating a second loop that follows through. So there's the loop there around the hip, and then there's just circular loops that go underneath around the lower abdomen. Now that circle at the bottom will be our first span of the thigh. So we need to create a few more spans that go vertically up the body. So I suggest doing it on the side of the body and just match up the amount of verts you need or the amount of edges you need to create that fill. Make sure you have the plugin F2 plugin turned on and loop tools turned on, and then just do a bridge. And if you have the right amount of edges on each side, you should get an automatic bridge. From there on in, it's just a matter of polishing that up a little bit, build out that volume around that um, upper thigh, and you already have the beginnings of your um, hips, bikini line, butt, and upper thigh. So once you've established those loops, it's probably a good time to start to just refine what you got already. Don't worry about the upper area of the body yet. Just go through and just redistribute some of those verts, redistribute some of those edges to sort of make sure they're evenly spaced, nice and clean, so that you know what the function of these loops are. So it's always good to learn functionally what each sort of area does. So I always like to make sure that maybe I have a center line, as you can see down the side there, that always looks up things. And then I start to fill out the torso. So it's nice to be conscious of the amount of edges that something is taking up or the amount of verts that something is comprised of. So just keep stock of that. And you can see the, the torso is super simple. It's just a series of um, mesh loops that go up to the chest. Um, and then what we're going to do again, keep refining as we go along, but already you can see that they were already getting some decent volume, some decent volume in the, in the thigh, the, the butt, the torso now, the abdomen's almost pretty much done, um, that we can start to just tweak things. Um, so that's super cool. So with that out of the way, we are now ready to start working on the shoulders and the chest, so the upper body. So with the um, shoulders, just do a single fill along the span of the inner loop and then create a split in between that one fill. And that will be sort of the first sort of uh, interface for the shoulder. It's where the uh, mass of the shoulder will take place. So add a few more spans and then you can start to link up those two um, circular loops that comprise of the shoulder and the um, bicep. Now you can see here that I've also added a sort of diamond um, piece of geometry there that will help us maintain some volume in that upper shoulder. So I've talked about that in the past where I talk about the you know compression and elongation of certain parts of the limbs. So um, it's always a good idea to have that in the shoulders because it really helps to maintain that volume. With that done, we can start to work on the chest. And what I've done there, I've linked up a continuous loop that goes around from the base of the chest up around the shoulder and then back around to the back. Now this can be um, changed in the future. So you'll find that when I start to refine my model in the future, that especially around the back, I start to change the geometry a little bit. But ultimately what you want is a continuous loop that spans from the base of the chest up around to the shoulder, then back around to the back. And that will allow you to create some volume to maintain around the chest. It will also allow you to get some really natural deformation of the body when you start to move your limbs, because when you move your limbs, you also move your chest around. So um, without it, it starts to feel really, um, well, anatomically incorrect. So it's always good to have that one loop that sort of spans around the volume of the chest, up around the shoulder, and then back around to the back. Now with this loop in mind, you have an option. You can have uh, continuous loops keeping going up and up around the shoulder up until you get to the neck or you can do what I've done here and sort of filled in a sort of grid like pattern within that loop to create some volume. So you have an option there. So whatever you see uh, here, um, you can modify it to some degree. And again, that's sort of why I'm sort of working through this stuff pretty quickly in this video because ultimately what I want you guys to understand is not the method it's the function, the function of these loops, okay? So the function of these loops are very important. How you get to that point, it's up to you. As long as you're maintaining a relatively clean quad-like structure, you are minimizing or completely not having them, uh, six-pointed stars in your, in your mesh, and you have zero spiraling going on in your mesh, 
then you are on the right track. Um, after that, it's really down to how you want your character to deform, what you prefer to see. So again, I can't tell you exactly how that's going to work for your character. So it's really important that you just experiment and play with it and see what works and what doesn't work and what deforms well. It's really up to you. And if you want a real true blow by blow breakdown of every single body part, feel free to check out my previous series on modeling stylized characters where I go through the torso, the back, the legs, the arms, the hands, the feet, everything. What I talk about here is largely the same, just sped up a little bit faster. But as you can see here, uh, we have pretty much completed the upper body within 15 minutes. And if I had sped this up 250% in terms of this time lapse, then it would have been around an hour to complete this part of the model. Now, overall, it took me about four hours to get through this entire mesh. So um, take that for what you will. So once you get familiar with this whole process, it actually becomes quite quick to create a base mesh like this. So as I said before, I wasn't happy with how the back was for this character. So I've gone through and actually simplified it, really brought down the poly count on that back around there, reduced those loops, but I'm still going to try and maintain the loop that goes around the chest and around the back. So you'll see that that loop will stay, on, it will stay in, in place eventually. Right now I broke it by accident, but you'll see me fix it up in the future. So again, it really is down to what you need. So technically, again, this is a technically correct mesh. It would deform fine for most purposes, but if you need a specific action to come from the mesh, then you need to consider the loops that you need to maintain the volume to create that kind of motion or articulation. So with the overall torso done, I'm going to go through and start to just refine what I already have. So I've turned on a subsurf modifier just to see how it looks with um, smoothing turned on. And I'm just going through and using the sculpt brush, no tablet here to do this, just using a mouse, basically polishing what I have. So let's start on the arms. So with a simple bridge, we can start to build out our arms. And because we had the same amount of spans on the initial two loops that I made for the shoulder and the bicep, they link up pretty much instantaneously with a bridge. You can see here that my loop around the chest is kind of broken, so I will go ahead and fix that in the future. But overall, I have a loop that goes up and around the shoulder, around the bikini line. I have one that goes around the butt. And again, functionally, this would be just right for animation, but I'm gonna add a little bit of optional volume around the butt and it's fairly simple to do this. Basically, you wanna cut a loop that um, sort of isolates um, some volume around the base of the butt cheek. And that will allow you to basically fill out a little bit more oomph if you need it in the butt. And you'll see it, it kind of works similar to the shoulder and it kind of works similar to the way that um, the eyes and the cheeks work on the, on the face. When you build those isolating loops, it helps to maintain that volume. So again, this is an optional thing you can do. It's completely up to you. Have a look at the way I'm building out these loops and you'll see it actually builds out volume. It has a little bit, adds a little bit of a pinch around the base of that butt. But again, this is completely optional for you. Now, technically I didn't need to do this. I didn't need to do this at all because it's going to be covered in clothes anyway. She's not going to be wearing a bikini. She's going to be wearing a dress. So if you're going to be um, clothing your character um, in the future, then this is largely a redundant loop. You don't need to actually do this, all right? But if you're keen on doing muscle men or pinup girls or muscle women or pinup dudes, then maybe you want to add some extra volume around those areas to accentuate their physicality then go ahead and try and build out some extra loops like this to help maintain some extra volume. And following this video, I will be posting a supplementary video for this, which is basically a turnaround close-up area of each body part to allow you to sort of analyze um, different body parts of this character to see what you like, what you don't like, and how you may be able to adapt these ideas to your own model. So that will be coming up after this video is published. But you can see exactly how, just by adding that one little change in the, um, the structure of the mesh helps to maintain that volume. Look at that, <laughs> it's really bubbly at the moment. I, I do bring it down a notch in the future, but you can see that's sort of the loop that we have. It, it kind of spirals, inverted commas, 
but um, it's still isolating function. What you don't want is to see a spiral going around the leg completely down to the foot. That's what you don't want. Loops that kind of wrap around the body a little bit aren't really an issue because they aren't affecting each other when it comes to the rigging process. Now for the leg, it's just an extrusion, extrusion of um, quads down the leg, down to the ankle. And again, be conscious of when you are modeling, you do tend to lose track of the structure of your model or the volume of your model. So don't be afraid to, again, take pause, refine what you already have, smooth out what you have, redistribute what you have, and make sure that you're sticking to your model sheet. You'd be surprised how quick it is to lose track of that thing. Like for instance, the thickness of a thigh isn't present at the moment. I have to add that in later. Um, for the leg, again, just an extrusion down to the um, ankle area. And we'll get to the foot uh, later on. But for now, um, we're just refining those leg shapes. And then we're going to go ahead and do the arms as well, which is basically the same thing, straight out line um, for the arms. Now, you have an option again of twisting that forearm a little bit in the mesh to sort of allow you to give yourself a little bit more give when it comes to rigging. That's completely optional again. So it's down to the way that your character will function in the future again up to you um, and of course you have the option of going either a t pose or an a pose for your character so again i prefer an a pose for my rigs so when i'm rigging something manually i prefer a pose because it gives me a little bit more leeway when it when it comes to gimbal lock again another thing for another day but for auto riggers such as mixamo or um, auto rig pro or Motion capture, especially motion capture, T-Pose is the way to go. So if you want to bring this into a mocap um, app, T-Pose is pretty much your only option, all right? So be aware of that. So T-Pose is your friend when it comes to mocap. But if you're doing a manual rig, A-Pose might be something you're interested in. Now, I haven't really talked through the process of making the R's because again, they're just tubes of meshes, okay? Really simple doesn't require me to go through that detail. How many spans you want to put down the arm? Again, it's up to you. It depends on the function of your character. So if you're going to have super noodly arms, then just go with whatever spans you need to create that spaghetti-like nature. If you want to add some really sharp elbows, then you may want to consider adding that double diamond um, structure that I mentioned in my previous series on character design. In this case, I'm keeping it as a simple span just for the sake of clarity. But um, again, uh, check out my previous videos on that um, on that topic when it comes to elbows and knees because again it's completely optional but you can see here within 25 minutes and if I sped this up 250% about an hour and a half maybe two hours I've largely got the body done that we can start to work on the hands pretty crazy now the hands I have a pretty clear method in mind for this now once you get the initial structure of the hand done it's uh, pretty easy to set up. So basically do an extrusion out of the wrist and then join together the mesh. So you end up with this sort of four sided quad. So you have a, a series of uh, a cross of quads at the end. All right. So once you do that, straighten that out and that will be the first middle fingers of your hand. Extrude out a set from the, uh, for the thumb area and for the index area and then one for the pinky. And that will provide the basis for your four fingers in the future. All right. It also helps to maintain the volume of the palm. So you end up with these nice um, chunky hands, essentially. Straighten that out for now and keep it fairly simple. And what we're gonna do is just sort of estimate where we need the wrist to be. We're gonna create a loop down the um, center of that wrist. And then from the middle of the uh, bottom of the palm to the side of the hand, we're gonna create an extrusion outwards. And that will be the base of our pad around the thumb, okay? It also creates a loop that allows us to create a span around that area there. Now, once you've done that, you extrude out the thumb and that's essentially the structure of the thumb ready to go for um, you know, adding detail. I add another span around the center line of that thumb to give us the volume that we need to maintain um, the structure of that thumb and that is pretty much it for the thumb. Very straightforward, I'm surprised, you know, it's surprising to see. Um, and then just sort of manipulate that to sort of take on that sort of perpendicular um, shape of uh, the thumb. So the thumb sits at a, almost a 45 degree angle from the index finger and the rest of the hand. So 
sort of rotate that to sort of estimate where you would want the nail of the thumb to sit opposite of your index finger. And then you can start to extend out the thumb structure from there on in. But overall, that's the overall structure for the thumb. Done, ready to go. Not really much else to do there. The complicated part is actually like how you go about uh, linking it to the wrist. So if, you have, if you're building out this hand separately to the wrist, how you link it up to the rest of the body is actually the more complicated part. So from this point forward, we're able to extrude out the fingers. Now I'm adding some spans down the hand and you can see it's actually populating all the way down the body. So this is what I'm talking about when it comes to being conscious of your poly density and the way that you isolate your loops. Obviously some things are unavoidable for the body compared to the face. You can't isolate every loop inside um, the body. It will have to travel down somewhere, um, especially if they're all part of one mesh. But if they were separate meshes, it's not much of an issue. But um, you may need to reduce your poly count to um, avoid it traveling around the body. Or if you don't mind the extra density, you can just have it travel down the body, no worries. Again, completely up to you, completely up to your circumstances, what you need and what you don't need. But you can see here, I'm actually going to just maintain the volume as it is for now. I did a little bit of experimentation there to see what would work, what wouldn't. But in the end, I just decided, uh, let's keep it simple for now. Let's get those fingers extruded and then we'll, um, we'll work it out afterwards. So what I'm doing here is just cutting out um, some extra spans to allow us to get the volume we need to extrude the fingers. Now, again, how I terminate those um, edges is dependent on the kind of hand that I want to make, how much detail I need to put into that hand uh, and what your poly count limits may be. But ultimately, I'm just creating a simple set of spans that go around to allow me to um, uh, extrude some fingers without really affecting the rest of the body. So the nice little side effect of this is that it actually helps you almost um, accidentally create extra padding around the pinky area of the hand and the area between the first knuckle and the fingers. So after that, it's just a matter of extruding out some fingers. And again, uh, depending on how much detail you need in those fingers, you can just do an extrusion like this, refine the fingers and be done, you're done. Don't worry about it. Um, if you need to add extra webbing, we have to do some extra um, things. And you'll see me do that in a moment where basically I bevel out some extra webbing between the fingers. So bevel it out, adding some extra structure in between those fingers. And once I smooth out, you'll see what I mean. Do that across all the fingers between the bases of the webbing. Merge what we need to merge to turn those into triangles at the edge. And then what we're gonna do is add a single span down the center of those um, webbing to maintain a quad structure. From there on in, that hand technically will be done. All you need to do is clean up a little bit here and there to maintain your quad structure. And there we have it. So then from there and in, you can start to work out the spans of your knuckles, work out the spans of your thumb, and start to refine basically what you have. Technically, technically, I'm putting a big caveat here. Technically, this is animation ready. So if you're happy with what you see here, just refine what you see here. If you want to optimize your mesh or work, uh, well, basically make it more efficient, then you can keep watching and see what I do. So basically for me, I'm just being pedantic from here on in and refining what I already have. So you'll see me cut away certain faces, redirect certain edges, that sort of thing. But ultimately what I have here could technically be animated just fine. It could be rigged. It can be um, manipulated in a way that would work just fine for um, the needs for most rigs. All right. So again, it's completely up to you how you go about refining what you've built out initially. So from here on in, I'm just gonna let it run, the video run for a moment, so you can just see what I do. Because again, from here on in, there's not much that goes on in terms of adding new loops or making changes. It's really just about manipulating what I already have and then refining it. So I'm just gonna let you watch this, take stock, try and interpret what the hell I'm doing, and then we'll continue on.
you'll see in a minute that I get to a point where I just decide, fuck it, I'm just going to duplicate my index finger across the other parts of their hand. That's completely valid. Go ahead and do that if you want to. Otherwise, you can manipulate each finger individually. Up to you. So in the next couple minutes, you'll probably see me add these pink edges to the knuckles of the hand. They aren't anything really special. They are just been assigned with a edge crease value. And that actually helps to tighten up those regions when you use a subdivision modifier to keep them nice and sharp. So if you don't want to end up adding extra sort of um, volume maintaining geometry, you can attempt or at least try it out using edge crease values to tighten up those knuckles. So um, to do that, it's just uh, right click on the edge, turn on edge crease, you'll get a value of one to zero. You can give it a value of one and that will help you maintain some um, sharpness. It's a really cool little feature in Blender.
just as I mentioned before, I do take some time to sort of experiment with volume around the hand and what I like and what I don't like. So again, this is kind of like a puzzle piece for you to find, to figure out. And let me tell you this, I've never seen a single hand model from um, a series of artists or whatever I've downloaded in the past. There's never ever been a hand that has been modeled exactly the same as, a, as one I've seen somewhere else. All right, so sort of like snowflakes, they seem to be one of a kind every single time. Um, so what I would recommend is if you like a certain hand model that you've created and you think it deforms really well, keep it. Keep it on the side so that if you make another model in the future, you can just reuse that one. All right, and then you don't have to worry about making a hand ever again. <laughs> All right, so um, again, you can see me just freaking around with um, edge loops and that interface between the palm and the um, the wrist and um, you can see a six pointed star there I try to refine it in the end I end up trying I end up deciding oh yeah I'm actually happy with adding some extra geometry down the wrist down the arm to the legs and to the neck because ultimately it'll actually help out with the structure of my model but if you're working in low poly that might not be an option for you so you may need to think of ways to reduce your poly count around the interface between the wrist and the um, the palm. So, yeah. Again, I'm leaving that up to you to figure out because again, it's really dependent on your needs. So you can see here, I'm because I added that extra span, I've decided instead of having traveling down the body, I'm just gonna have it travel through to the middle of the back and that will help at least reduce some of that poly count. And by extension, I'm going to also fix up that shoulder that um, I broke the loop for. So eventually I'll fix that as well. So again, there's a little bit of trial and error. It's almost like a puzzle solving task that you may need to do. Um, don't get frustrated. It happens to everyone. It's part of the process. All right. And that really is something to hammer home here. I know I'm halfway through the video, but this is a thing that you should understand that, especially if you're doing this for the first time, everyone goes through this. It is not um, an instant result. All right. It's up to you. It's it's, it takes a little bit of brain power to figure this stuff out. It takes patience. It takes um, trial and error. All those good things that come with doing something properly come with modeling a character, okay? So don't get frustrated if it doesn't work out the first time. Walk away, come back, and you'll see the solution in front of you. It happens all the time. So for example here, I'm not really happy with the way that the mesh is spiraling around the hand. No, you know, it's not really a bad thing. I mean, it would still deform fine. But, you know, in the end, I've decided let's not be too fussy in this regard. Uh, this, is not, this is not a character that I need to put into a game engine or anything like that and maintain uh, a low poly count. Let's just bring the spans and let them go down the body, let them go up the neck. And in the end, it actually worked out because the head has quite a few polys that I need to link up to uh, in order to you know, join the two meshes together. So um, it might actually be a good thing for me to put those spans in their arm so I can actually connect the head to my body efficiently. So um, sometimes you may end up having some happy accidents. And don't be afraid to modify what you think was already complete. So for instance, you'll see that I try to add a span um, down the wrist and then it travels around the butt. And I'm like, okay, wait, right, let's not do that. Let's alter the butt a little bit. So the spans ro roll down the leg instead of around the butt and down the bikini line. That's okay. You don't have to uh, beat yourself over the head with, uh, you know, telling yourself, oh shoot, I gotta redo something from scratch. No, just, uh, just fix what you need to fix, all right? So here's that golden moment where I decide, oh yep, let's fix up that loop around the shoulder um, so I can get the spans traveling down through the back properly. So um, again, altering what I already built before, refining, fixing up some loops, it's all part of that process. The big thing to maintain though, is that you have structural loops that help to maintain volume around certain areas. So again, shoulders, hands, bikini area, legs, etc. 
All right, so you are trying to maintain those volume, those key loops. Everything else is secondary. It kind of can be up in the air with how you go about it. Once you have those key loops though, you know where you need to maintain structure. Once you've got that structure, you can fill out the rest. So here's a little bit of me just, you can see me, my, the cogs in my brain ticking to see how I can solve uh, a edge loop problem. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of you just moving the camera around and think, mm, this will work and then it works. So yeah, <laughs> sometimes it just requires a bit of uh, patience. Um, so you can see here that the distribution of my face is looking a little bit dense in some parts, a little bit looser in other parts. But ultimately at this point, I think I can get away with just um, smoothing out the mesh somewhat. I think it will still deform really well. Um, and adding some extra structural loops where I need to um, around the front of the thigh, for instance, will help to at least keep things consistently the same sort of density. Um, in your case, it may be completely different. You may need to add or remove loops in different areas. Uh, for me, the, the area that looks a bit more problematic at the moment is the upper half of the arm. And if I smooth that out, hopefully that will feel a little bit better. Um, but otherwise I'm pretty happy with what I've got. So for the next minute or so, all I do is go through what I've uh, already made and just clean things up. So just polish what I already have. I don't remove things, I don't add things, except then. <laughs> um, I just refine what I have, okay? Um, and if you do need to add some minor structural uh, loops, you can probably get away with doing that. But otherwise, it's really just smoothing, inflating, moving, tweaking, polishing, that sort of thing. Now, eventually, I will come to the point where I decide to reduce the poly count at least a little bit on the top of the hand um, because it just looks too dense on the top of the arm, in which case I just go through and yeah, well, you'll see what I do. And you'd be surprised just how much difference removing one or two spans can make to the optimization of a mesh. So you'll see in a few seconds that um, I'm going to reduce some spans down the top of the arm. And it's a simple reduction of three spans down to one. And suddenly things start to feel a lot more well distributed. Um, just by doing that, the upper arm feels a lot more consistent with the lower arm and um, I can deal with the density of that arm from now on. Now I'm just going to refine a little bit around the neck in the anticipation of me linking the head to the body, um, but I'm not going to do that yet. I'm just going to get ready for that. So um, just refining what I have. Um, again, this is optional. This is just me going through my thought process. So your thought process might be different for your model. Um, you may not need to do this. So um, again, just think about that in mind. Um, from there on in, I just extrude out what will be the base of the neck.
So with the bulk of the body done, it's now time to move on to the feet. And just like how um, we spent a good chunk of this video on the hands, the feet are just as complex in some ways. So um, you'll see again, just like my previous series, I did fuck up the feet a little bit. I added a spiral when I accidentally shouldn't have. Um, and that was down to me just being a little bit careless about my grid fill. So um, when you are filling out the base of the foot and you'll see me do that soon, uh, make sure that when you are filling it in, you aren't overlapping or crisscrossing your edges. Where I mean by that is that you you fill one edge to another edge that is in front of each other, and then you end up with a natural spiral just by accident. So, um, <laughs> barring that, the method for building up the feet is pretty decent. I think. I think it's my it's my it's my straightforward method of doing the feet. So basically, extrude out the 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 um the base of the foot, add some spans along the um, the length of the foot and that will give you the structure you need for when you you know want to deform the foot with a rig. And then from there on in, we can extrude out the toes. Now, again, depending on how much, uh, how anatomically, ad anatomically correct you want the foot to be, you could add webbing to the in-between of the toes. But in this case, I'm never going to get that close to the feet. So I don't do it. Uh, pretty simple. Um, yeah, so you'll see me uh, extrude out the toes very shortly and they're just straight up extrusions out and then a few spans out for the, um, the toes. Now, what I'm doing here, I'm just calculating how many spans I need or how many quads I need to build up the toes and I haven't quite got enough. So I do an extrusion outwards from the inside of the foot. So just naturally following the contours of the big toe I add a single extrusion outwards to give the structure I need to be able to extrude out the toe, which is essentially a thumb if um, they weren't opposable. Now you could technically just add a, a new span going up the leg and then it will travel up to the body. Um, that's completely up to you, it's completely valid, but you're just increasing the poly count to a ridiculous amount if you're trying to maintain a certain amount of polys. That might not be the best plan for you, but um, if you're just um, wanting to create some volume as well, this method of extruding out a little bit will actually help to maintain or create the um, volume you need to get the foot looking correct. So that's an actual um, bonus for this method here. So as you can see here, I'm literally just extruding out the toes. And just like the fingers, I want to keep um, the structure fairly simple, treat them like digits, and then just smooth them out realign them at the you know feet do have knuckles uh, i mean toes do not have knuckles so make sure you add some spans onto those toes as well to give it some shape um, and then it's just really about refining what i have now the, the mistake i make uh isn't so much with this part here the method of what i've done here it's how i feel in the base of the foot so that's where i really make that fuck up now as long as you don't do that by accident you won't have this problem you can just fill it in and you should be fine just make sure that when you are filling in the base of the foot that you're lining up the edges to create a consistent loop that goes around because the result is, well, potentially uh, a little bit more time fixing things up. And you can see when I do this, I do fuck it up and it takes me a good you know, few minutes to clean up, remove and realign the spans around the foot. So I think I was being late. I wasn't being lazy. I was just being impatient and I did a grid fill. And by doing that, I ended up creating a spiral that went around the foot. Now, again, it's really dependent on whether you even give a shit about whether there's a spiral around the foot. If it deforms properly and you're happy with it, then you can technically just get away with it. But in terms of like geometry, it's not ideal. All right. So again, it depends on how lazy you are, what your requirements are. You can probably get away with it. In my case, I want to do the right thing. So I go through and fix it up. This is the part where I realize my mistake. I try adding a loop somewhere on the foot and it spirals all the way up the leg. That's what you don't want. That's a spiral, all right? That, that, that spiral went all the way up the leg. That's what you don't want, all right? You want to avoid that like the plague. Otherwise you have geometry going all the way up the body. So at least try, if you're gonna have a spiral, at least try and isolate it to a certain limb or an area of the body um, that won't affect the rest of the body 
or try to eliminate it. In my case, I just tried to eliminate it 100%. And again, this is kind of a trial and error puzzle solving kind of thing. Sometimes it may require you to delete whole areas of that limb or whole areas of that um, appendage. So um, it may be a good idea to just take a breath, look at what you've got and see how you can fix things. So what I'm gonna say here is just watch the process, watch my thought processes as I go through this, um, how I'm going to determine how to fix this. And the, um, the real answer is just being able to, again, isolate my loops and determine where those loops are traveling. So it's always good to test where they're, where they're, the, how the flow is working. So there, I've cleaned out that loop around the edge of that foot or that toe. So it only, that loop only travels around the toe and then back around. So now I've eliminated that, that instance of a, of a spiral. Now it's a matter of cleaning up how the toes link with the uh, rest of the foot. So again, I'm cleaning up the connections, making sure that um, that loop that goes around the big toe is now isolated. Now that won't be contributing to a spiral. And now if I select the loop, now it's no longer spiraling. So I've filled it out. That's looking nice and clean now. What I've got left is a triangle. And you know, that might not be an issue for you, but again, I'm just keeping it quadded up. Now I have this one last spiral to fix up. And really the answer is just to delete it and then just clean up the connections again. So going through, cleaning up the connections, seeing what uh, I need to do to make it work, counting my edges, and then determining how to link it up with the rest of the leg. So what I've discovered is that I can get away with doing one more loop that goes around the foot. So I actually end up linking that up to get a nice another, another final loop around that edge. So they're doing extrusion, fill in that gap. And now I have a nice clean non-spiral loop around there, flatten that out. And then I basically filled the gaps between the ankle and the, um, the rest of the foot. And there we have it, problem solved. So the great thing about this now is that I can add as many spans as I need around the structure of that foot without affecting the rest of the body. So again, I'm isolating loops where I need to. And if I'm, you know, being careful, I'll get it right. I'm avoiding those spirals traveling up the body. So believe it or not, the overall structure of this whole mesh is pretty much complete. All right. Uh, barring a few extra spans here and there to get some some extra volume, it's pretty much done. Um, now, if you want to add breast tissue to the um, the character that you're making, you can choose to just do an extrusion outside within the breast tissue area, within the breast muscle, or you can just push out some of those verts to give the impression of breasts. So um, it's up to you. But the nice thing about this is because we've made that initial loop to maintain um, some volume around that chest area, you can at least isolate that volume and push it out. So you can either push out these faces here to maintain some breasts, or you can do an extrusion inwards to create a span that gives some extra volume to allow you to sculpt out some breast tissue. So again, it really depends on how you wanna go about building your model. So if you don't need breast tissue or to build big, you know, balloon boobies, then you probably don't even need to do this. And especially if you're going to be putting clothes on this character, you probably don't need to add that sort of volume. Now it's time to link up the head with the body. So what I've done is I've mirrored everything together. So I haven't applied the mirror. I just uh, applied the mirrors for both the face and the body. I've joined the two meshes together with a uh, control J. And now I'm going through and trying to figure out how to best link up the neck. So always being conscious of the density you can see that the neck of the um, head is a lot more dense than the body. So we have to figure out a way of reducing the poly count on the uh, head. And I do that at the base of the skull or the back of the skull, somewhere where the hair would obscure any um, weird artifacts that would come from um, the render. Uh, you can see here, I still have some issues. There's still some spans that need to be uh, filled in. 
And my solution is to either, again, optimize the head a little bit at the back of the skull, or I can redirect some extra um, verts. So what I've done actually at the front of the neck, I've actually redirected some loops to sort of loop back around up to the face. So um, not only does that help reduce the polys going down through the body, it also naturally gives you enough volume to potentially add um, muscle tissue around the neck or like an Adam's apple. So um, that's an option for you to try out as well. So you can see here, I'm trying to reduce the polys going down the body by redirecting around the base of the neck. So that actually is a structural loop that can actually help you maintain some volume around the neck if you need it. So from here on in, I'm just linking up those meshes. I still have the same kind of issue where I have a few polys that um, are traveling down the neck that I don't want to have going down the hand because it will spiral around the hand, come back up the body, down the leg, and it's a pain in the ass. So basically, I want to eliminate uh, an edge loop. So to do that, I'm reducing some polys down the base of the skull. And again, this takes a bit of trial and error to figure out where that loop will end up going, what I can delete, and here we are just working out what I can keep, what I can remove, that sort of thing. And in the end, I end up deciding that, yeah, maybe I can get away with adding one extra loop um, up the body and down to the eye. And then I have to make sure that's symmetrical because I'm, you know, a fussy little bitch about that so i decided to add an extra loop at the base of the eye um eventually i'd have to add one to the lip as well but i didn't do that in this video um yeah it's all right all right since we're done with the mesh we can actually start to test it out with some animation and what better way to do that is with our classic method of using mixamo so yeah just pop over to mixamo if you don't have an adobe account just make one it's free, it's okay, not completely evil. In fact, they're actually helping out us by investing in Blender development. So um, yeah, what are you gonna do? Um, so yeah, chuck it into Mixamo, give it an upload, follow the prompts, and you can test out your rig. And just to show you that the proof is in the pudding with these loops and that I'm not full of shit, let's check out some footage. Now, would you look at that shit moving like a charm. Now, I want you to pay close attention to those loops I highlighted at the very start of this video. These are the loops that matter. They determine how your model deforms. All the other parts, relatively okay. Just go with a quad mesh, you're cool but those loops that help determine structure and form and volume help to maintain the structure of the deformation look at it it's moving like a charm now if we just pause the animation for a moment and then look at those loops closer up you'll be able to see why specifically around the crotch area i know it's weird to say this but that crotch area really does matter because the way that the legs sort of crush between the hips and the thigh, you get a really clean break. You're not, you're not going to have, like, by having that one loop, that, that bikini line loop that, like, goes around the body, around that bikini line area, you're separating the thigh structure from the torso structure. And the same can be said about the shoulder and the arm, even the chest area. Those loops help to offer the volume and the separation you need to get an instant result. So you're less likely to be fucking around with weight painting. You're less likely to be fucking around with corrective shape keys. And if you do have to make corrective shape keys, the, the flow of the mesh is going to aid you in smoothing things out rather than get in the way of cleaning up the deformations. That's the cool thing about this structure it all works to help serve the next part of your production. Anyway, next video, we're going to talk about how to make braided hair and stylized hair. So it'll be similar to the previous series, but we're going to do some more complicated um, styles. So because this character is actually meant to be Daenerys from Game of Thrones, we're gonna do some full on braids. So that's gonna be really fun. Um, after that, clothing, and then we'll wrap it up from there. 
Other than that, I'm going to say thank you for all my patrons who have so far uh, pledged to my channel. I really appreciate it. And for those who have been watching on YouTube, uh, I really appreciate those who have subscribed, liked, and uh, commented on my videos lately. Um, it's been really fun to see what everyone says about the, um, the work that they do. And some of you have been sharing your work as well, which is always great to see. So if you ever want to share some stuff with me, feel free to tag me on Instagram or Twitter. And with all said and done, I may as well say catches and have fun. Cheers.